What do most Fortune 500 executives have in common? They learned important lessons on the fields and courts of their high school and collegiate sports teams. This is true for both men and women. Ernst & Young found that a whopping 94% of women holding a C-suite position played sports. Their wins and losses shaped their habits and who they would become. Join me on my journey to sit with some of the brightest executives in the world as we discuss how sports shaped their professional trajectory. In partnership with Chief Executive Magazine, the voice of America's CEO community. I'm your host, Don Yeager, and this is Corporate Competitor Podcast. I drew concentric circles of who do I want in the inner circle, the middle circle, and the outer circle. In our lives, we often have Winnie the Poohs in our lives, and we have Eeyores. I knew that if I had some Eeyores in my inner circle, that I needed to actually move them a little further out. It didn't mean I need to not be friendly with them, but maybe rather than see them every day or every week, I needed to see them once a month or once a quarter. So I actually kind of built a team around that. But one of the things I really wanted to do was dedicate my time in that inner circle to my wife, to my parents, and to my kids. Greg, thanks for joining us. Don, it's great to be here with you today. You know, as I was studying you, I read that you credit the work ethic you developed growing up in Heston, Kansas, working on your family's farm to much of what you've been able to accomplish in your career. You even said that working on that farm actually taught you more than you learned at Harvard Business School. Tell us what you mean by that. Yeah, no, it's uh, I started working when I was in the third grade. I got my first job on my great uncle's farm. It's about four or five miles outside of this Mennonite farm town of Keston, Kansas. Very faith-oriented town. It was a dry town. It was 95% Mennonites. I have Amish relatives. Very tight-knit town I grew up in. I drove my bike out to my great uncle's house, rang his doorbell. He asked me to come. And he had actually planted these pine trees along what doubled as a driving range and a landing strip. So he uh, taught himself how to fly and flew airplanes. And he wanted these pine trees to be watered over the summer. So my first job was watering these pine trees on his uh, on his farm. And he said, OK, Greg, we got to negotiate your rate. You know, I was in third grade. I sat down and I said, how about 75 cents an hour? And he said, great. And we shook hands on it and had some cookies and iced tea. And I uh, got on my bike and rode home. And I got home and my mom was so upset that I asked for 75 cents an hour. She thought 50 cents an hour was good enough that she put me in the car and drove me back and made me go and apologize and say 50 cents an hour would be fine. And I learned one lesson out of that, which was never let your mother negotiate for you. So I haven't let her negotiate anything else in my life. <laughs> She's fantastic. Uh, but there was nothing else to do in Heston, but work, play sports and hang out. What I learned doing that was how to work really hard and what that meant. And maybe more importantly, how to treat others with dignity and respect. You know, when you were a kid, you ended up working with a whole variety of people. So not only did I kind of work on the farm, but I worked in this golf course crew in the mornings in high school. I ran a furniture distribution warehouse with a bunch of people distributing office furniture in the afternoon. And then I'd go buck bales at night. So it was a very full day. But you really worked with a whole bunch of different kinds of people during that time. And uh, you really learned how to treat people with dignity and respect. I think those lessons of how to work with a variety of people are some of the most important lessons in your life. You made the great transition there. You're talking about the idea that like in Heston, right, a town this small, you either worked, played sports or hung out. I know your golf team was really great there, but you also played football and basketball. Tell me about sports and what it taught you as a young person. Sports are just a fantastic thing for young people to do. I was very serviceable at sports, but I was not a superstar. My contribution in basketball was a lot of banging and rebounding. I was not going to be the guy that hit the 25-foot jump shot from the outside. So I had to learn how to work within a team structure very early on. You kind of learn your role. And I think being part of a great team in business or in life is actually knowing what role you should play. So I think a big piece of that was learning that. Also in sports, you learn how to win and lose. Hopefully you win more than you lose, but if everybody plays sports, almost by definition, at least in football or basketball, everybody cumulatively is going to be 500, right? right? Because two teams are playing. So you're going to learn both sides of that equation. 
you know, how to win gracefully and how to lose gracefully is really important. And then how to actually build the team structure that's necessary to win consistently and to have some really great teams. There's a lot of lessons in there for building the team structure in businesses. Two of the tests I use in business probably came from sports in terms of evaluating people, right? One is the IQ dipstick test. You and I would understand this, Don, maybe some of the younger listeners wouldn't, but you used to in cars actually check the oil with what's called a dipstick. And it would tell you if you were one quart's empty or two quart's empty. And, you know, if you find somebody that's just two quart's empty, you need to help them find another role because, you know, it's not probably going to work in that role. That's the first test. Is the person fundamentally able to do it? But then the second test is, is this a person you'd want to fly across the Atlantic with for 10 hours and talk to, right? And that's the test of, can this person work with others? Are they enjoyable to be around? Both of those lessons you really learn in sports. You could have some pretty good players in sports, but if they were ball hogs or just weren't willing to work within the team and they were all about their own stats and didn't have the sort of flow and the understanding of how the whole team game should work. That didn't work out very well. You kind of wanted to be on a team with people you really enjoyed being with. You learned that pretty early on. And as you're building a team, whether it be in sports or in business or in life, you really wanted to have those people around that actually made you better, that built into you, that gave you energy and encouragement and enthusiasm. I love those two tests. The IQ dipstick test, which I'm so glad I didn't know you earlier in life because I'd be afraid (laughs) what level of oil you would have measured on me. But that second one, is this somebody you'd fly across the Atlantic for 10 hours with? Because you're right. We are better when we're in the presence of people we actually enjoy and care about. And we're better when we're together and things. But When I looked back at sports for you, your sport of choice or the sport that you seem to flourish most in was golf. What is it about golf that drew you to the game? Golf is one of the harder sports to master for all of us. It can be an inherently very frustrating sport. It's a four-letter word. Yeah, exactly, for (laughs) sure. But some of it was a little bit by accident. My dad actually helped develop the golf course in Heston, Kansas, one of the nicer golf courses around. We were also only 20 minutes from Prairie Dunes, one of the top 50 courses in the country and one of the world's best golf courses for the folks I grew up with and the golf team that we built. A lot of us were kind of attracted by that. We had it in our backyard and it was something we could practice and spend a lot of time at, which we did endlessly and get really good at. And we got good enough where we won the state championship my sophomore, junior and senior year. Heston won it for another six or seven years after that as well. We were not only good enough to compete at our level, which was 3A, so we were kind of mid-sized for Kansas, but we go to tournaments before competing against our own level and do very well against the big schools as well. So we had some phenomenal golfers. I played like number three or number four on the team, but we had two guys that actually ended up playing, you know, big time college golf. And one is a pro in uh, Wichita now. He's actually carded a 59 on a pretty difficult golf course. Uh, I hopped on the back of some of those guys too and spurred them on a little bit. You know, we reached out to your high school's athletic director actually to ask about your time there on the team. And he shared about your state championships and a team and its success. So you had those windows of time where you're achieving success at a really high level on that sport. What's your greatest memory of that window? You know, it's hard to win state championships in high school sports, right? All right. And when I was a sophomore, we actually won by, I think it was one or two shots, which was the first state title Heston had won in anything. When we came home, it was a pretty big deal. And they had this billboard in the middle of downtown. They would just announce community events like, you know, the Lions Club is having a pancake breakfast or whatever, you know, I can remember they put something that said, congratulations, Rob, Dave, Alan, Greg on winning the state golf championship. It's a weird little memory. At the moment, we were kind of like a whale in a bird bath, right? You know, we were a big fish in a small pond, but (laughs) the pond was so small, we were, you know. It was a bird bath. It wasn't even a (laughs) pond. It was a bird bath. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So anyway, but you remember those things as a kid, right? But the truth is a celebration of someone else's success is something that, yes, you remember it as a sophomore in high school, but people remember it even today. When we celebrate them in our office or our business, people remember you and the opportunity to celebrate them. And so that's, what a great lesson. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And you carry that to business. We developed some programs when I was at Continental Airlines that would celebrate. Our sick leave calls were really high when I got to Continental. The airline was in very good shape, what I called the 10th place airline. It was 
10 out of 10 in on-time performance, 10 out of 10 in baggage handling, 10 out of 10 in customer complaints of 10 airlines. Had 10 presidents in 10 years and went bankrupt twice in 10 years. Other than that, it was great. <laughs> so we had to create a culture change here. To your comment on recognizing and rewarding people, one of the problems we had is people were very depressed, so they wouldn't come to work, right? And they'd call in and we'd have to replace a pilot with another pilot, a flight attendant with another flight attendant. So we actually just came up with a simple system after we fixed a few things. Well, we did two incentives. The first one with the show up for work thing, we said, we'll actually draw for eight fully loaded Eddie Bauer Ford Explorers, company pays the income tax and hand them out for everybody that has perfect attendance for six months. We do attendance from January to June or July to December. And we create a special parking space at the front of wherever they work, whether there's a reservation center or a hangar for the pilots and flight attendants right by the airport, right in front. And we put them actually in the airport. We put them in the terminals and put signs up for what the cars were gonna be drawn for. So everybody had to walk by it. Passengers would walk by and see these cars too. We had Ford paint them in Continental Airlines colors. Very cool. It was really a lot of fun. And I'll never forget about 10 years after I left Continental, I was up having barbecue up north of here in Conroe and a gentleman comes up to me and he says, uh, Greg, you don't probably recognize me. And I honestly didn't. He said, you actually gave me a car about 15 years ago. And I said, I remember, you know, it was a lot of fun. And he said, yeah, the Eddie Bauer Ford Explorer is still in the parking lot. I still got it could you come take a picture with me in front of this 15 year old car? So it's just amazing the longevity that that kind of stuff has, but that kind of incentive, we created another incentive. We were 10th place in on time last forever, right? We said, if we're number one in on time, we'll give you a hundred dollars every month, you know, in a separate check. And if we're number two or number three, we'll give you $65. We announced that program in, on a February. By April, we were actually number four. And by May, we were number one. The airline just turned so fast that people were so motivated to get that $100. Isn't it crazy? $100, right? Yeah. They didn't even believe we'd probably do it. By the way, it was costing us $9 million a month to reaccommodate passengers for being late. So to get their bags to them, to put them up in hotels, to pay overtime to our people because the flights were late. And we were spending like $3 million a month on this $100 incentive, right? Wow. So they get a separate check and it would say, thank you for helping us be on time, Gordon and Greg. That's just for being on time. So if the customers won, the employees won. The first month we passed that out, I got a call from a flight attendant and she said, Greg, do you know what $100 is to me? And I said, I have no idea. She was crying. She said, I took my kid to the cereal aisle of the grocery store and I told him to buy all the sugar coated cereal I want. She said, nobody's ever given us anything before. So I wanted to share it with them, which was a sweet story. And then a mechanic called me and he said, Greg, do you know what $100 is to me? I said, I have no idea. He says, it's two beers and a table dance. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, that's why I don't ask. I don't want to know anymore, but I just want to give you the $100. So, uh, but we had a great team at Continental Airlines. I love it. You know, if you could walk into a town and see your name on a billboard, even if the next day it's going to have the pancake cook off, right? Yeah. That's what it does to people. That drives people. It changes you from the inside, doesn't it? Yeah. So golf is generally thought of as an individual sport, but in high school, college, Ryder Cup, there are a few places where it truly is more of a team environment. In the time you had with the great players that you had around you, what did you learn about teamwork as a golf athlete? In golf, it is funny because it is a bit individual, but the way it worked when I was there, initially you had four man and two man team, four guys, and then you could win the four man or the two man championship. And then it changed by the time I was a senior to where you'd have five guys, you'd take the four best scores. When you're playing in that kind of environment, you just have a sense of not wanting to let your team down because they're riding on you for this event. So while you're playing individually, the success is very collective. There were some great moments in there because you'd have good days and bad days. I mean, in golf, it's impossible to have every day be a good day. When you had a good day, it was really important to get out there and encourage those that weren't having such a good day, right? Yeah. Because that was going to be you tomorrow. <laughs> you, you knew. So I think you learned a little bit about humility through that process. Golf's a humbling game. Isn't that the truth? And not to get too high or too low, that nothing's ever as good or as bad as it seems to be at that moment. As you look at situations in life, 
enjoy the euphoric moments, certainly celebrate them. But when things aren't going that great, just recognizing that, you know, it's going to be fine. You learn those lessons in sports like golf because you hit a lot of bad shots. At least I did. I'm finishing the book right now with Bubba Watson, oh, fantastic. the golfer who's won a couple of masters. Yeah, no. You talk about humbling, right? But Bubba said the other thing that's so great about golf, when you think about it as a skill, is that it's a multi-day event yeah. at the highest level. You can have a good day and a bad day, but the key is you don't want any bad shot to become two bad shots and three bad shots. And he said the really good ones are the ones that shorten the window around a bad situation. Again, great business lesson. That's true for us. Yeah, it's a great life lesson in life and business. The other thing I love about golf is it also just creates these great events that you can uh, just enjoy each other and enjoy the company. And, you know, I hadn't seen my parents in about a year. COVID, right? Mm. They've now been vaccinated. So this week they made their way down to spend time with us. And on Saturday, my son, my dad, and I will go out and play golf together. But just being able to enjoy that with family and friends, it's just such a, such a pleasure. And that goes for me for skiing. And I get to hang out with some pretty crazy athletes when I do some of that stuff. And my dad and I had a chance to go play Augusta National together too oh. for a couple of days a few years ago, which was a real highlight for him. Just being able to do that is a lot of fun. Speaking of crazy athletes you've gotten a chance to hang out with, I know that you have a great friendship with Eric Weinemeyer. Yeah, so Eric's one of my best friends. We were just texting yesterday. We're setting up another ski trip for in a couple of weeks. So, uh, By the way, real quick, for those who don't know him, he's a blind individual who has climbed Mount Everest, the seven highest summits of every continent. He skis blind as well. He skis, he kayaks. It's easy to be inspired by a guy like him. Yeah. I try and do one stupid thing with him in the summer and one in the winter. Normal for him, stupid for me. In September, we did a 50-mile single-day mountain bike trip over the uh, Continental Divide together. That was fun. What I want to do is actually, there's a mountain, a 14er in Colorado called Quandary, and I want to skin to the top of that and ski off that with him. So we're trying to set that up. There's been too many avalanches to do it now, but maybe later in the year we'll be able to pull that off. It's very inspiring to be with him. I mean, he's overcome every single obstacle to do amazing things. It's fun to spend time together. We both get a lot out of that. And we do some backcountry skinning together and hiking in the summer. And it's just fun. So we have a good time. He kayaked the Grand Canyon a few years back, all 277 miles. I saw that. Crazy. No, it's just unbelievable. I had the chance a couple of years ago to hear him speak at a convention where I was also speaking. And I stood in line for 40 minutes to get him to autograph a book. <laughs> yeah. So who else inspires you? A lot of the stuff I like to do now is in the mountains. For those events, I have a number of friends out there, Eric, and there's another the guy by the name of Eric Alexander and stuff. I'll be able to go and get some inspiration from those guys. They're crazy good athletes. In spite of the fact they're getting a little bit older, they, uh, they can still bring it. They put up with me, basically. And I love that. So great inspiration from those folks as they offer that athleticism. Is there someone from the business or in the inspirational world of content that you love to try to follow and pay attention to? Absolutely. So I've been very fortunate to have a series of mentors, and I won't be able to talk about them all. Started with my great uncle, Lyle. His mission in life was literally to actually mechanize things for farmers. So when he was a kid, you go out to the field and you'd have to shove loose hay onto the back of a wagon. He thought that was a lot of work. And he invented the original hay bale machine that makes the round bales and the square bales. He turned it into a Fortune 500 company. He also invented the auger that takes a grain from the combine to the wheat truck and many other uses as well, because you used to have to just shovel that. His mission, his true mission was to give away all his money before he died. Hmm. At 97, managed to do that and died at 99. He used to tell me he was the pig, not the chicken at breakfast. He wanted to be committed, not just involved. <laughs> so he started a whole bunch of cool nonprofit charities. But through my life, I've had Senator Lloyd Benson spend a lot of time with me and mentor me, oh. George H.W. Bush, 41. I've got great stories about these guys and fun times with them. They're unbelievable. You know, they grew up in the greatest generation, you know, and oh yeah, that's just an unbelievable thing. The folks I kind of look up to and spend time with now and really enjoy are the founders of Home Depot. I'm the lead director at Home Depot. I've been on the board for 20 years and Bernie, Kenny and Arthur, the three founders are still alive. Bernie's in his 90s and Kenny and Arthur in their 80s. 
And they're just unbelievable human beings. They built not only a great company, one of the world's greatest companies, but they're so generous and so thoughtful. And the life lessons they've imparted on me have been so meaningful. Very much appreciate them. Arthur Blank has always been fascinating to me. I did a book with one of his co-owners of the Atlanta Falcons, a guy by the name of Warwick Dunn, yeah. running back, who then became a part owner of the team. Yeah. The things he shares are all kinds of amazing. Yeah, Arthur's amazing. Arthur invites me all the time, but I go to one Falcons game a year, at least with him. The last time I went, he actually had Rhonda and I, my wife and I, sitting with Jimmy and Rosalind Carter. <laughs> which was a lot of fun. It was a real thrill. Especially for someone who loves politics as you do. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, it was fun. So so this podcast is built on this theme that a disproportionate number of Fortune 500 executives, according to research, were actively engaged in sports at the high school and collegiate level, and that the experience of athletics actually helped shape the way they lead today. I know you had that experience, but you've also been around people like Arthur, really good high school player at Stuyvesant High School football. Albert Carey at Unify ran track and field at the University of Maryland. So you've been around these folks. Al still looks like he could run track. We had a Home Depot board call yesterday. I didn't see him live, but I saw him online. He still looks like he could run the quarter mile in about a minute. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. I don't know if he can. You can challenge him to that, but he looks like it. I won't challenge him. I'll challenge to watch him. (laughs) But having been around people who are wired like you and lead like you and believe like you, because many of these folks do, do you agree that that ability to have had athletics in your background helps you and has helped you develop a leadership model for yourself and others? Oh, absolutely. There's so many lessons, you know, in leading through sports, whether it's how to pull a team together, how to win and lose, who are the really good coaches you had in your life and who are the not so good coaches and which ones do you want to emulate? Because at that point in your life, you're so impressionable to your coach that you can tell good leadership and not so good leadership. Being able to observe and watch that and participate in that and feel the highs and the lows There's not very many places like athletics where you can feel the high and the lows in such a compressed period of time. Things happen in a basketball in a couple hours, in football in three hours, golf in four hours. It's not days and days and days. And to play through the range of emotion and be able to stay focused and stay on task. Really great lesson. So who were a couple of the great coaches of your life, people who influenced you as a younger person. I had a coach and he's actually in the same retirement center that my parents are in now. His name is Carl Boyer, fantastic human being and a great coach. He coached basketball and he coached golf. He was a really good basketball coach. So he knew exactly what he was doing. He knew how to pull a team together. He knew how to run an offense, never got flustered. He wasn't beyond running you or yelling at you or making you hurt, but he just had such a positive attitude about it. I actually see that in a coach that's coaching college basketball now at Baylor by the name of Scott Drew. Oh, yeah. Very strong faith-based guy and so positive. He's just so inherently positive. And that rubs off on the kind of players he gets and I think the kind of teams they have. But he didn't know much about golf. So he wasn't giving anybody any swing tips or anything like that. He was like a bus driver, basically. But he always was encouraging He'd be out on the course all the time, riding around in a golf cart, checking on you. But he wasn't giving you technical leadership. Not technical, but emotional. And golf is such an emotional head game, particularly when you're 14 and 15 years old, right? Yeah. You know, when you want to chuck your club. But he was just very encouraging and always kind of promoted keeping your cool. And as you said earlier, Don, not letting one bad shot become three or four bad shots, right? Right. So out of high school, you were a swather, right? Yeah. That was the mascot. That's a piece of farm equipment for those of you who don't know what that is. So. And then you go to Washburn to become an Ichabod. Ichabod, yeah. I love it. And then we talked about you go to Harvard to become a Crimson. I never had a normal mascot ever in my life. No, you never got a bulldog or a, or a tiger or a bear or something. Flaming spear. Yeah, no, no. yeah. But last year, you returned back to Washburn and shared some advice with students there. And you said you need a one-page plan for your business, but also you need a one-page plan for your life. Mm-hmm. Give me the one-page plan for Greg. Brenneman's life. Yeah, no, happy to do that. It's been fun at Washburn because they're now doing a course on my book, which the top students are kind of selected for that. And they prepare a one page plan for life as part of that course, Mm -hmm. which I think is pretty fundamental. It's doubly important because when we grew up, Don, there used to be some courses in high school 
that taught things like how do you balance a checkbook? Of course, nobody has a checkbook now. It wasn't necessarily a one-page plan, but it was a guidepost. That doesn't exist anymore in the curriculum. So it's been fun to kind of add that back there. The Bible talks in Revelation about a church in Laodicea. Jesus says, you're neither hot nor cold, but you're lukewarm, so I'm going to spit you out. In terms of my life, when I got to be about 45, I'm 59 now, I had run Continental and Burger King and PwC Consulting, been successful in that sense. Thinking back to my Uncle Lyle's example of not only business success, but real success in changing people's lives, always believed if you could create a job for someone, you could really speak into their life. I said, I really need to write a plan to turn around me. If I've been using these one-page plans to turn around businesses, really figuring out what the key value drivers are to making a particular business work and to turn it around with a group of coworkers, I wonder if I can write a one-page plan to turn around me. I took out a sheet of paper and I said, let me try doing that. The first thing I wrote was, I want to become an intimate of God's. A.W. Tozier, who's a theologian, has a statement that God does not have favorites, but he does have intimates. So I said, what would it take to do that? And I wrote down some things. I changed what I was reading. I changed sort of how much time I was spending in prayer and things like that. But the most important thing I did was that is I got three other CEOs who were of the same face structure I was, two fellow Kansans, but moved to Texas, which were Bill Nath and Kyle Van, and then another gentleman that we knew by the name of Hal Chappelle. And we agreed that we would meet every Sunday morning from 6.30 to 8.30 in the morning before church to memorize scripture, listen to a sermon or read a book and talk about it and share our requests in our lives, hold each other accountable. For the last 14 years, we meet probably 40 Sundays a year, you know. Two hours. And during COVID with church attendance being a little different, a little harder, that became precious. Yeah. We even meet a little longer than that now because we don't have anywhere else to go afterwards. So that's been pretty fundamental. The other thing I wanted to do is make sure I dedicate enough time to those that are really important to me. So I drew concentric circles of who do I want in the inner circle, the middle circle, and the outer circle. In our lives, we often have Winnie the Poohs in our lives, and we have Eeyore's. Winnie the Pooh, if you read the kid's book, is a very energetic young bear. But Eeyore is a donkey that is always down and always depressed and always kind of dragging everybody into his misery. I knew that if I had some Eeyores in my inner circle, and you can't use this for family members, by the way, but it works for everybody else, (laughs) that I needed to actually move them a little further out. It didn't mean I need to not be friendly with them, but maybe rather than see them every day or every week, I needed to see them once a month or once a quarter. Probably better for me and better for them. So I actually kind of built a team around that. But one of the things I really wanted to do was dedicate my time in that inner circle to my wife, to my parents, and to my kids. I listed some things I wanted to do on that. One of the things I wanted to do is make sure I spent time with my parents every year, just alone. And I've done that with my kids. And then Rhonda and I actually lead these young CEO couples on marriage retreats every year. And initially I was doing this mentoring just with guys at our house up in Beaver Creek in the mountains. And she finally asked me, why are you going off twice a year to spend time doing these boondoggles with guys? What about me? And it was a very good question. I'm guilty as charged. So we started about 14 years ago doing that with couples. So it's interesting. I read about these. What kind of advice are you offering to them as couples? We have a curriculum that we walk through. We start with some leadership lessons. A guy by the name of Larry Sen from Sen Delaney has these leadership tools called blue chips. You know, in poker, there's red chips, white chips, and blue chips. Think some things are more important than others. And it was actually the core component of building the go forward plan for your one page plan for your business. Mm-hmm. Stephen Covey would call that begin with the end in mind. There's uh, the mood elevator and then a tool called be here now. So be in the moment. And I use them a lot. And we take them through some leadership tools. And then after that, We actually talk about marriage, parenting, how do you carry your personal ethic, faith and ethos and values and teamwork into the workplace. So, you know, how do you reflect on that? So the discussions are really around those kinds of topics. And then by the end of the weekend, they have to collectively write a one page plan for their life and their marriage. Oh, that's powerful. It's actually been a joy for us to be able to do it. And we've had some fantastic couples through that. I can only imagine. You know, many people in business, 
I think, overused the word team, right? So a turnaround specialist like you gets it more than anybody, and especially someone who has athletics in their background. But when evaluating companies that you're looking at, how do you take a group of disparate individuals, maybe with the same business card, and bridge them over and create a team? Any structural advice you would give us on moving a group of individuals and creating a team? First thing you got to do is make sure you have the right individuals. So it goes back to that two-part test, the I2 dipstick test and the fly across the Atlantic test. But after that, what I've always enjoyed doing is taking those send Delaney tools, the Be Here Now, the uh, Mood Elevator, Blue Chips, and actually doing an offsite where we all develop a common language around how to interact with each other, how to work together understand each other's strengths and weaknesses a little bit, but develop that common language like you do in sports when you call a play to where if you're having a really bad day, I instead of saying, hey, you're acting like a jerk today, I can say, where are you on the mood elevator? And maybe you should go go get a coffee or walk around the block because you don't make very good decisions if you're depressed, despondent, angry. You make really good decisions where you're grateful, thoughtful, you're higher in your kind of mood. And even in a day, we all have swings from lows to high. I'm much better in the early morning than in the late afternoon. Some people are much better at night than they are in the morning. So it's partially a let's develop some common language and some teamwork and let's do some fun activities together. And it's partially let's then apply that to where we're going to go as a business. Taking that time and actually making sure not only did you pick the right people, but you're doing the right coaching and you're providing the right input to create a common language to then be able to execute on a common mission is really important. And sports teams do that, right? Absolutely. You start practice early before you play a game, you put your plays in, you figure out who's going to play what role. Many businesses skip all those steps we all learned as kids playing sports. That's so true. Today, as executive chairman of CCMP Capital, you've invested in all kinds of amazing places, AMC theaters, Quiznos. And in the years that I've been working to study leadership, one of the things that stood out to me is curiosity as the most significant trait of a great leader. The beauty of curiosity, in my opinion, is if you possess it, it's a sign of humility that you don't know all the answers. That's a good thing. It's also a sign of self-confidence that you're willing to go get in search with all these amazing experiences, the changes and the places you've led, how do you hold and remain curious today? It's actually, I think, Don, pretty easy to stay curious because I think the three most underused words in the English language are, I don't know. And there's a lot I don't know. And if you look at that mood elevator on the Send Delaney scale, the express button in the middle of the mood elevator to the top is curiosity. If you can actually become a great interviewer, which obviously you are, you've mastered that skill, but you can become a great interviewer of people and great at asking questions and letting the answers emerge from the questions. Even if you know the answer and you're trying to lead somebody there, instead of saying, oh, I think you're making a totally wrong decision, asking that a different way and saying, hey, give me a little bit about why you're thinking that way. I want to understand your thought process of how you got to that. And sometimes in the unraveling of that, it's the best coaching you could ever get. Absolutely. And part of what you're doing as a leader, almost all of it, actually, when you're a CEO, you have to set some general direction, but you really are assessing talent and making sure you have the right people in the right spot to execute that plan that you've all agreed you're going to execute and making sure that you're pouring into them. That becomes 98% of what you do. I love it. In my career in journalism, one of the things I've always done is tried to nail one question that I get to ask everybody and I've gathered all the answers. But the question I've always asked is, can you identify a habit, something you built into your daily routines and regimens that you believe allowed you to separate yourself from others? A habit that you think would be really important in what's made Greg the leader and the man that he is today. Would you share your habit? I start my day the same way every day, and I think it's the consistency of showing up to do that. So I start by working out for about an hour, hour and a half. I'm relentless at exercise. I'm probably addicted to it, some people would say, to exercise. So I like to do that. I use that time to really clear my head and think. And then I try and spend some time after that, a little bit of time, just in meditation and prayer with some thoughtful reading. I get up around four or so to do that. If I can get my day started like that, the rest of the day seems to follow pretty well. And I'm very consistent about that. But if for some reason I fall off of that, 
I'll find I'll get sidetracked during the day a little bit more. And I won't come back to it later in the day. No. And so if it doesn't happen early, it won't happen. Well, let me first say that on the two tests, the dipstick test, your IQ clearly off the charts, but most importantly, you passed the 10 hour test. I would hope the flight would get delayed so that I'd get more time with you. Greg, thanks for opening up. I'm grateful to Cody Foster at introducing us, but I'm also grateful that you would take this time and that you've proven to us what it means to be a corporate competitor. Well, thank you. It was a pleasure to get to know you. I hope we get to spend some more time together and I really enjoyed our time today. If you could share one habit, one thing you've done consistently that allowed you to separate yourself from your competitors, what would it be? In my 30 year career, 2,500 of the greatest athletes, coaches, and leaders answered that question for me. This is Don Yeager who did that, uh, I was, that article I was telling you about. Don Dave Sims with Coach K, how you doing? Hey Don, how you doing my man? Great sir, how What they gave to me is what I'm giving to you in my online course, Journey to Greatness. Through engaging storytelling and on-demand videos, you will learn the 16 habits that will jumpstart your personal growth. I will instruct you on how to apply these winning characteristics to your life through custom workbook exercises. We are slashing the price for our podcast listeners. Lifetime access to Journey to Greatness is normally $399. But for our podcast listeners, it will be $49 with the code podcast at checkout. Click the banner on corporatecompetitorpodcast.com to enroll. Thanks for listening to the show. I would be so grateful if you left us a rating and a review. We will be rolling out a new episode every Wednesday. To be the first to listen, subscribe to the podcast on our website, corporatecompetitorpodcast.com. Plus, as a thank you gift, you will receive a free chapter from one of my best-selling books on the habits of high-performing teams. Stay in touch by connecting with me on social media at Don Yeager, Y-A-E-G-E-R, on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Until next week, I appreciate you.